Okay. Got it. So today, uh, uh, Kev, um, I'm going to butcher your name, Kev, Abaz Zatian, who is in the Department of Physics and Astronomy, is going to talk to us about the universe. And um, this is basically our agenda. Uh, welcome, announcements. Then we'll get into the main presentation, um, Q&A, and then people can hang out uh, as they wish. So first of all, welcome anyone who's new. If you are new, please uh, put your name and email in the chat so we can reach out to you. And uh, any feedback you have is greatly appreciated. And if you have questions about humanists in general, uh, stay online after the meeting and we can answer any questions that you might have. Um, Zoom tips, uh, we'd like people to stay muted until Q&A. And if you don't mute yourself, I will be happy to go in and mute you. And then at uh, Q&A, we can open it up and people can ask questions. And also feel free to put any questions in the chat. Um, video mute, if you move away from your screen uh, or for any reason you don't want people to see you, you should go ahead and view mute your video. Um, there's an option between gallery and speaker view, um, but, which is, should be in the upper right of your screen and you can switch between the two. Um, so the chat, you can promote anything you'd like, put comments in, questions, and don't forget to save the chat at the end so that you have a record of um, the reaction button in Zoom will allow you to raise your hand, which is good for uh, Q and A. And uh, as I said, we are recording, so um, it's up to you if you want to mute that, mute your video, rename yourself, whatever you would like to do. Um, during our meetup site for news and events, I think most of you probably came through our meetup. Um, uh, Mary, if you could put information about membership and donations in the chat so people can see that, that would be great. Um, you should join the American Humanist Association and we can talk about um, humanism, volunteer opportunities and so on. So um, here's the brief summary of humanism from Rhett a comprehensive philosophy of life or worldview that uses the latest knowledge of science, logic, reason, empathy, and morality as a foundation to lead meaningful and ethical lives that aspire to the greater good for all, which includes humans, animals, and the environment. Um, the uh, AU uh, chapter is hosting Evan Clark of Atheist United next Saturday at 4 p.m and you can go to um, the meetup site there and uh, sign up for that and get the link. Um, so this universe, um, Professor Abbas Ajian is a professor of physics and astronomy and the director of the Center for Cosmology at UCI. His research focuses on the nature of dark matter at the interface between particle physics and astrophysics, the origin and cosmological impacts of neutrino mass, galaxy formation, high energy astrophysics and precision cosmology. And he got his PhD at UC San Diego in 2001. And I'm hoping that he's gonna explain to us some of what's in his bio here because I certainly can't. Um, here's some more information uh, about him uh, that you can look at. And I think we're ready to um, have him. Um... Would you like me to do a further introduction? Because I'd, I'd uh, written out an introduction. As you covered it, it's some of it already. Why don't you go ahead, Larry? All right. So uh, we, we 
he is a professor at uh, University of Irvine, California. You saw many of the subjects he's working on. In addition, I picked out particular experiments he's, he's part of. The CMB S4 experiment, the Athena X-ray Space Telescope, and a co-investigator on the Cycle 1 James Webb Space Telescope, which recently launched. Um, personally, I know Dr. Abazagian as president of the Democrats of Greater Irvine. And besides being a leader and activist in the, the Democratic Club, he ran for Irvine City Council himself, bringing his science skills and knowledge into the arena for public policy. So that uh, as you saw the Green uh, Ribbon Committee, he is an expert on tracking climate change he favors community choice, energy, and green transit. Uh, and uh, since the uh, COVID outbreak, um, I had uh, talked to him on occasion about COVID statistics. There's many things in public policy that are based in science and mathematics. As a candidate with a science background, he was endorsed by 314 Action a national organization for STEM candidates. Okay, so between what you had and what I had, we're ready for Dr. I've been practicing his name and I've known him for a couple of years. So Abba Zajan, I think it's right. Uh, his first name was Kavork, but we call him Kev when we can. Dr. Kev Abba Zajan, History of the Universe. Thank you, Larry and Steph, for the introduction. Um, uh, it's fun to, I think my iPad actually shut down the screen. Here we go. Let me restart it. Uh, thanks all for joining here. I am using a new iPad, so it might be a little wonky to use. First time here. <clears throat> it worked in the preview. Now it's being silly. Okay, do you see my screen or no? No. Right. This says you have been you have started screen sharing, but the rest of it's black. Yeah, this is a catch twenty two of new technology. It worked perfectly on the on the test warm up earlier. Maybe you need to select which screen you share. Yeah, no, I'm selecting the. Uh, there we go. All right. There we go. Third yeah. time's a charm. I use an iPad for teaching in this uh, remote uh, epoch, and uh, and I just needed to upgrade my seven-year-old one. So this is the first time using this one. Apparently, it's a little more touchy about share, screen sharing. Thanks all for joining. Um, this is it's always fun to give uh, uh, general audience talks about uh, astronomy and cosmology. Um, yeah, I'm Professor Kev Abazajian at UC Irvine and have been um, here at, in Irvine for 11 years this year. And uh, I was actually at the University of Maryland as a faculty member there for five years prior to that. And was at uh, Los Alamos National Lab and Fermi National Accelerator Lab as a postdoctoral fellow. Uh, and before all that, that covers every time zone, by the way, um, I was at um, UC San Diego for my PhD. So I was happy to come back to Southern California. So, uh, you know, I, I gave a, a big uh, title to this in terms of the history of the universe. And uh, this is a picture of our universe as put together by astronomers today. And we will, um, uh, we will go through why this is what it is, uh, what we what we know about it. And before we get to a the history of the universe, we might do a little bit of a history of the history of the universe. Um, 
uh, about 2000 BC, this was uh, the view of the universe, the whole universe by Egyptians. And um, here the, the, the goddess Nut is the night sky. The stars are actually on her body and um, the sun travels across her body uh, and uh, she swallows it at night and gives birth to it during at dawn. And this was the picture of, of the universe uh, according to the traditions of the Egyptians at the time. Um, and then about 1000 AD, didn't, things didn't change much in 3000 years, uh, except there was no longer a, a goddess Newt. There was some fixed uh, stars. There's some stuff going on in the heavens, who knows what. Um, I guess there were th ideas and earth was flat and don't fall off the edges. Um, uh, still the view at some places of the world, I guess, I don't know. Um, and then if you get go forward in time now 1785 about 785 years after that last map of the world or the universe uh, we get to Herschel's map and he was actually the first astronomer to attempt to map the heavens uh, he uh, took looked at the night sky he saw there was a band of stars and that was what was called the Milky Way there are darker uh, you know places where there's more stars than others he assumed that all stars have the same luminosity and they should be spread out in uniform density. Therefore, this kind of uniform map. The sun sits right in the middle-ish of it. And uh, that's his, that was the picture, uh, you know, not that long ago on a human time scale. This is, uh, you know, uh, a, few, a few hundred years ago. If you jump forward to just 100 years ago, 101. Uh, the Shapley model was not actually very different from the Herschel model. The sun is no longer in the center because we're not gonna make these assumptions of constant density and luminosity of the stars. We knew there was a bulge towards the center of our galaxy of stars and that there were these uh, star clusters and spiral nebulae around it. And these were thought to be orbiting the center of uh, the galaxy. So there was this disk of stars, the Milky Way, and its size was about 300,000 light years across entirely. That's 300,000 years for a single, uh, for light to cross it and 30,000 light years or so uh, thick. But outside of this, there's nothing. That was the whole picture. And what really changed uh, was data, uh, new astronomical methods, and, uh, and, uh, and observations. So why is this the universe, our view of the universe now? And so let me get to that. We're gonna start somewhere familiar. Uh, and uh, you heard your, uh, I'm based in Irvine. Uh, this is Irvine City Hall uh, on a protest day. It's a good thing to do there um, if needed. And uh, this is a plaza in front of the hall and the police department is on the right here. And um, if we uh, zoom out uh, above it, here's that plaza again, where we saw the protest, lots of ample parking in the city of Irvine, including at city hall. Although sometimes on busy days, you have to get out here somewhere. Um, we're gonna zoom out by a factor of 10. So this is uh, at the, we're doing the powers of 10 uh, and for Irvine in Orange County. Right here, uh, the city hall is about one tenth the size it was before, and we're getting to see a lot of Irvine. Another factor of 10, we get out to seeing a large fraction, almost in the entirety of Orange County, and uh, including the mountains out in, uh, towards San Diego Canyon, Crystal Cove Park, large green space that's been preserved. Um, and then we go another factor of 10, and now we get to see quite a bit of Southern California, uh, San Diego, LA, all the way out to Santa Barbara. We're at kind of an overview of, of Southern California. One more factor of 10, and we're at the Earth scale. That was a big step because now we get to see this curvature of the earth and it's really just takes that one extra factor of 10 to get there. And um, 
you get to see the, the entire, uh, almost the entire United States. And uh, with one more factor of 10, we're at truly the planetary scale where we get to see the entire um, globe. And still uh, from above, you know, Irvine's there in Southern California. So, um, can you all hear the audio? Yes, we can. Okay. Oh, yes. All right. Well, I didn't want that to happen. This is, I think, the vid uh, video sharing does it, but that's fine. Um, I'll talk over it. The um, the uh, view that we see now in this this uh, this video is created by the American Museum of Natural History. And y'all might know the uh, director of the planetarium there called the Hayden Planetarium. Uh, his name is Neil deGrasse Tyson. And, uh, but they actually have a full astronomy department and uh, astrophysics curated section. And they put together this uh, based on uh, known data of all of the artificial and uh, natural satellites of the earth. And then going out to the planet, the, planet, the solar system scale uh, they've colored in the orbits of the planets. And now we're going to get to uh, uh, further and further, and they're measuring time in terms of light travel time. So this is now one day light travel time away. And then uh, because the sun is so bright, they actually turned it down until now, and they put it at the tr its actual brightness. So we're, we're at one light year away now. Now we're getting to see actually the, the constellations become 3D because they're not a 2D surface uh, like the old models. And uh, that is the globe at which is uh, the extent of our radio signals since the first radio transmissions have gotten to, which is about 70 light years away, um, 70 or 80 now. So now we're at 100,000 light years. That's the scale of that of our galaxy. And we're getting to other galaxies now. These blue and green and red dots are other galaxies. They were created with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey that uh, um, I was involved in at, at the National Labs. There's this V-like structure where we can't map as well because of the presence of our own galaxy. And then there's the furthest objects we've mapped out uh, as astrophysical objects, which are quasars. And then this colored red, green, blue structure is a cosmic micro background. And that's that structure that I that we saw from uh, at the very beginning. This is our cosmic horizon. And that's the furthest we can get uh, any kind of view of. And uh, that's the uh, truly actually the furthest structure, furthest structure we can um, measure and see is the this surface called the cosmic microwave background. And I'll say more about why that is in a bit. Um, so the, the real transformation that got us to go from this island universe of stars from Shapley uh, in about 1921 happened in less than a decade. Uh, Edwin Hubble, using methods uh, developed by Henrietta Leavitt of Cepheid stars, was able to find that those little spiral nebulae that were thought to be near our own uh, galaxy of stars are actually islands of stars themselves that are much further than 300,000 or 30,000 light years away. They're 6 million light years away or more. Okay, That is the scale at which they started to map them out using uh, variable star information. And they found out that the universe was expanding. Uh, the further you, these nebulae were, and these other galaxies, the faster they were receding away from us, uh, from the red shifting of the light uh, in their, their spectrum. Um, even Edwin Hubble makes mistakes. He labeled velocity in kilometers, dropped a unit uh, per second. But he did discover that the rate of expansion of this, these objects from us is proportional to their distance. And uh, nicely enough, that constant of proportionality was named after him, the Hubble constant. And in cosmological terms, that's the current uh, Hubble expansion rate are called H naught, where zero means now. 
And um, when we talk about the expansion of the universe, we're not talking about the fact that the galaxies themselves are moving through space away from us. It's in fact that space itself is expanding. So if I was in person, I would have brought a balloon with me and blown it up and you would have seen the dots on the balloon. Uh, um, you can actually get these kind of polka dot balloons at Daiso, among other places, I'm sure, um, uh, that, uh, that the dots separate out away as you expand the balloon. And it's not because um, they're moving on the surface of the balloon, but the surface of the balloon is expanding. Um, so uh, I th this is a very simple calculation, right? Uh, just so we can get our uh, get used to uh, these kinds of concepts. If you go 60 miles per hour for one hour, of course you go 60 miles. And this is uh, um, the level of calculation I can even show to elementary school students. Uh, you multiply 60 miles per hour by one hour and you cancel your units and you get 60 miles. So uh, this is the dirt equation of physics. Distance is equal to rate times time. And we can actually start doing some cosmology with the dirt equation. We know the speed of light is 300,000 kilometers per second. And if we multiply that by the length of time of one year in seconds, which is approximately pi times 10 to the seven seconds as uh, physicists, many physicists know, uh, you get 10 to the 13 kilometers. That's the scale uh, that we're dealing with in terms of the um, scales of the Hubble distances of 6 million light years. So it's 6 million times bigger than the um, uh, uh, 10 to the 13 kilometers. So um, we're really getting where the exponentials are large. So Hubble's law is this, and we can immediately, from the fact that the universe is expanding, get some very important quantities from this knowledge. One is that we can get the size of the universe. Uh, if we solve this for the distance, then we know uh, the, uh, the um, uh, size of the universe that you can see is distance time, is the, the, that rate of expansion times the time that it takes. <clears throat> and, um, and we can also get the age of the universe, okay? So immediately one over the Hubble expansion is the age of the universe. And uh, you get from the Hubble constant, actually 14 giga years, which is not too far off, amazingly. You can also get that size that I was talking about, the, the total size that it could possibly be. And the fastest possible thing is light. So uh, the total size is C times the age of the universe, which is one over H naught. And you get, uh, a quantity for the size of the universe. And it's big, about 10 to the 23 kilometers or 14 giga light years, okay? For, um, uh, you know, just basically multiplying giga years by the speed of light, you get light years. So this expansion, again, is not just, uh, just that galaxies are moving away from each other. Uh, uh, in fixed space, it's space itself that's moving away. It's just another way of seeing that. So how do we get this map of, of the stars and, and, and galaxies? Well, uh, some of the first surveys were done actually in the 1980s. Uh, the CFA Harvard survey measured the positions in 3D of 1100 galaxies. So, uh, really pretty new to get this kind of scale of data in, in, in astronomy. Uh, but it took a lot of work because they actually have to do every single galaxy individually, manually uh, with astronomical observations. They did a slice in the sky that's six degrees by 130 degrees in the, in the, in, on the sky. And this was called the first CFA strip. And there's like kind of a figure of a person here, which actually turns out to be a cluster of galaxies. Uh, you can also see these structures that seem to point towards us. Uh, there's a number of them, including this, this stick figure. And uh, these are sometimes called uh, the fingers of God because they're pointing towards us. Um, and this scale here is given in uh, CZ. Uh, it turns out to be in, light, in this more familiar unit of light years. This is about 700 million light years. 
Um, and so it, that's about a, a hundred times bigger than what Hubble could do in his measurements in the early 20th century. So I got to be involved in the largest galaxy survey to date uh, that started in the late, uh, uh, it was developed in the, in the 90s and started in the late 90s and the first data was taken uh, about 2000. And uh, you might think it's one of these big telescopes. Actually, the survey telescope is this one back here. It's uh, on a platform away from the ground to try to get better seeing for the structure. And it doesn't actually have its own dome. It's, it's on tracks and it's moved uh, in the daytime uh, to this uh, barn-like structure over here. So it's an open telescope on good seeing nights. And here's another view of it and some, some of the astronomers uh, that helped build and design and build it in front. So the Sloan actually has a map that is, uh, we had 700, 700 million light years. Um, it actually has a scale that is 2 billion light years for its main galaxy sample. So uh, we're, uh, this, is, this is this slice, and it's again a slice of it. Um, and it's got uh, about a million galaxies within its survey. And the, the why it's able to do it so much more at such volumes is because it has an automated system for taking spectra of all of these galaxies. And uh, we're getting up to, um, uh, at to about 8 billion light years away for the furthest structures that it does. So how far can you see in the universe? So we talked about this horizon. Uh, again, let's just take that dirt equation of physics. The furthest distance we can go is the speed of light times the age of the universe, or the furthest distance we can see. We got this number about 10 to the 23 kilometers. And um, that's not where we're going to get to. There's a couple of problems, several problems with this calculation. One is that we've not taken into account the expansion of the universe and the curvature of the universe. Uh, but also, we can't see that far because uh, the universe becomes opaque before that distance. And that's that faint glow and a spherical structure that we, that we saw at the very first slide. Um, so is, is 14 gigalight years or this 10 to the 23 kilometers, how far you can see? Um, it's not that far because the universe becomes opaque before then. And why does it become opaque? Um, and um, it becomes opaque because uh, light uh, uh, in an expanding universe at earlier times had shorter wavelengths. So uh, this is one of the first calculations we do in our on undergrad astronomy classes is how uh, light redshifts. And it redshifts uh, beca not because of um, uh, anything other than the fact that space itself is changing in, in um, uh, uh, underneath it, basically. So as, we, as, you, as you go, um, forward in time, things get red shifted. As you go backward in time, things get blue shifted, meaning it gets more energetic with a shorter wavelength. Uh, the density of light also goes down, sorry, up. So if you have a bunch of photons, which are wave packets uh, in some volume, as you go back in time, that volume shrinks and you get more, uh, more light particles per physical volume element. And then, what happens is you get so much energy within the light that the light heats up any of the matter that is coupled to it, which is all the matter, normal matter that we know of, it gets hot itself. And you go from cold things like planets um, and stars, which are actually uh, hot things, but you can actually get them even hotter if you uh, go uh, back in time, and you form a plasma with every single part of the universe. All of the gas becomes, sorry about that, didn't think that would happen. My son's actually all simultaneously doing a science fair with OC Science Fair presentation right now. My wife is zooming, is FaceTiming into it, so that's the beauty of our era right now. Um, all right, so we can see almost, uh, what is it that we can see every day, almost every day, especially in Southern California, that isn't a plasma opaque to light? Zoom era, people speak up less. 
what is a plasma we see almost every day? TV. The sun. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, and there it is, a picture of the sun. Don't look at it directly in real life. Um, the, uh, the sun is actually an opaque plasma. It has a surface where light has decoupled from the plasma. And uh, the universe actually has a surface where light is decoupled um, uh, from the plasma at very, very long distances. And so it's kind of like if you um, think of it as the, a cloud layer that covers the entire sky. And we can, you know, we can see light through the clouds, but that light is scattered and um, is released uh, by the surface of the, the, the clouds after that scattering process. So it's kind of like clouds, although clouds are not a plasma, of course. Uh, so we can look up and we can see clouds. This is a, uh, looks like a construction worker. I don't know why they drew, drew them that way, but he's looking up at clouds here. And that, those clouds are the cosmic microwave background. It's where the universe became a plasma and we can no longer see any further up there. And uh, the early universe is this time prior to the cosmic microwave background decoupling. So th this cosmic microwave background exists and it can be mapped. Um, just like the Earth, the Earth has maps of it, of its surface, and we can project uh, the sphere of the globe of the Earth to these kinds of productions that look like an oval that try to maintain the geometry and curvature of the Earth. And we can do that with uh, uh, the globe of the sky that has this plasma res residue all uh, coming towards us. This is a, a GIF animation of just uh, the Earth's surface at varying degrees of resolution. And as you get to higher and higher resolution, you get more and more information, of course, about the surface of the Earth that, you know, you go from no information to the presence of continents, and then all the way eventually to the presence of um, Florida and uh, uh, small uh, islands. So, of course, higher resolution, the better, the more information that you get. And that's what, as a lot of goals of, the, of cosmology has been to get at that resolution. The fact that cosmic microwave background exists has actually been known uh, as an observational phenomenon since 1964, when um, uh, Penzias and Wilson discovered the cosmic microwave background at Bell Labs in New Jersey as an accident in their uh, transmission uh, uh, towers uh, and receivers uh, in New Jersey. They had these very large receivers for uh, telecommunications and uh, they would get a background that they saw that they couldn't get rid of and that background turned out to be the my cosmic microwave background, um, which they only speculated, I think, in the very last sentence of their uh, paper that uh, they said, we're told that this observation could be a relic of the, of the early universe. Um, turns out they were right. And um, it was uh, this, this structure that was uh, actually predicted uh, by George Gamow uh, decades earlier. So they measure the temperature of the cosmic microwave background to be three Kelvin. This is an absolute unit temperature. So this is about 270 Celsius below zero Celsius. It's very cold. The universe is already in its heat death. And um, so it's three Kelvin. And uh, they measured that very, very smooth uniform surface. They didn't actually see any anisotropies in it. It wasn't until the 1990s where NASA put up a mission called the Cosmic Background Explorer that was able to resolve features on, on that surface. It had seven degree angular resolution, so it wasn't that great. It's kind of like seeing the Earth at this resolution. You can make out the continents, but not find features. But they were able to see the anisotropy on the sky at the level of one part in 100,000. And that was enough level in order for later structures to be formed. And just to give you a concept of what one part in 100,000 is, it is like measuring fluctuations on a billiard ball of half a micron, or which is half a millionth of a meter. So it's a very careful observation to be able to get at that level of anisotropy. Um, after this was done, the goal was to do it better. Uh, this particular observation of getting the anisotropies 
at all uh, won the 2006 Nobel Prize in Physics. Now we're at this level for full sky measurements. This is the European Space Agency's Planck probe. It's the best image yet of the cosmic microwave background. It took data from 2013 to 15. It's ultimate data came out in 2018. Okay, so it was, uh, it was able to map out that surface of the, of the universe at uh, 0 0.08 degrees angular resolution, uh, which is like the earth at this level of precision. Okay, you can see Florida. So this, what this does is it gives us a detailed map of the initial conditions of the universe. That detailed map tells us what the structure, the level of structure is at various scales, from small scales to large scales. You can put those initial conditions into a computer and then solve for what it should look like today. You can also infer where those uh, structures came from at early times. So this is a plot which, with the ridiculous amount of orders of magnitude in it. It's 100 orders of magnitude this way and about uh, 60 orders of magnitude this way, okay? Now, this is the radius of the observable universe. We just talked about how it's about 10 to the 23 uh, kilometers. Um, and um, in centimeters, it's a couple orders of magnitude more than that. And so uh, this is the radius of the observable universe. If we had such a structure in early times, what what we know about from that cosmic micro background is that everything was uniform back then, even though those different parts of the sky are in, not in causal contact. They can't be because the universe couldn't all talk to itself at those times. So there had to be something that set the universe to be very uniform at some very early time. And this is called inflation. This took uh, the universe from something subatomic to something astronomical. Uh, another thing that the inflation does is create a uniform universe, uh, but with a small level of fluctuations at that one part in 100,000 that we saw in the anisotropy of the cosmic micro background. And that's what gives rise to structure that we see today in the galaxies and the cylindrical sky survey and others. One thing I won't talk about, and this is a different topic entirely, is the fact that the size of the universe's expansion is now accelerating and we're getting a, a, an accelerated expansion uh, due to something called dark energy. So last topic is the fact that we know we, we've got these quantum fluctuations that were the seeds of structure and they're, they lead to the uh, galaxies we see today. And this is one of the earliest computer simulations, but it produces structures that were consistent with the, the dark matter structure seen in galaxies today. And um, uh, basically, just by putting small perturbations in a grid of particles and evolving them with time with gravity, you, you produce the universe seen today. And these, this, this kind of uh, uh, simulation has gotten to unprecedented levels of detail. Here we have uh, models of the, uh, for instance, the Great Wall. That There's that man that we talked about before, in the fingers of God. Uh, this is the CFA2 uh, survey. Uh, Center for Astrophysics at Harvard. This is a Sloan Digital Sky Survey volume. That's a bit bigger than that, of course. There's another European survey called the Two Degree Field Galaxy Ratio Survey. That's this field. And the models for the structures that can arise from the early universe, just putting in the initial conditions from the cosmic micro background, give statistically, of course, you don't predict where which galaxy is going to be where, but you predict statistically what that structure is like, and you get it today. So this is just, again, a, I added this just to this morning to this talk, because I used to give this in, uh, uh, in, early, in history of the universe talks. And uh, it's a bit much, but it, it kind of gives, gets, it ties it all together. Here we are today at uh, about 14 billion years old. Um, at the, on the right-hand side and the left-hand side is very early times. The universe uh, inflated as, as that inflation period that we, I showed about before. This is the radius of the visible universe at very high energies, very early times. Uh, in terms of Kelvin, we're talking 10 to the 27 Kelvin um, in standard models of inflation. Ele electroweak symmetry breaking, is, is this is where the Higgs particle gave, gave the normal particles mass. That occurred at a much lower scale, at about 100 GeV. 
the uh, point at which quarks became incorporated into hadrons and protons and neutrons uh, was at about 170 MeV. Um, there was a point at which neutrinos decoupled from the background of thermal background, and that was at about one MeV in scale. The cosmic microwave background is this late phenomenon in a way where the universe is 0.3 EV in temperature, where the photons can decouple from the plasma. And then today we sit here at about three Kelvin, which is 0 0.0002 electron volts in energy, very low energy universe. So it seems like we know everything, but we don't because there's like these, the, in the standard model, there's two big components that are totally unknown. And this is what a lot of the research in, in our group at UC, at, at UC Irvine uh, faculty work on uh, is the nature of dark matter. Uh, we don't know what that is at all. We know how it behaves in structure, but we don't know its particle nature. And if, something more, more mysterious is a uniform uh, kind of zero point energy called dark energy that um, creates about 70% of the mass energy of the universe. So we have a 1% level precise determination of the universe, but we don't have, uh, we don't know what 95% of the universe is. It's unknown material in terms of dark matter and dark energy. And that's one of the biggest questions that remains uh, in cosmology work, particle cosmology and particle astrophysics work is to understand um, uh, that mysterious, those mysterious components. So this is one of my favorite pictures is from um, uh, 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 the Galileo Observatory uh, probe that went out towards Saturn and Earth is sitting here um, in the distance, our, our pale blue dot as Carl Sagan liked to call it. So thanks, I'll take questions now. I hope I didn't go too long. Ray, thank you. Thanks, Larry. Oh, and I have some resources here. Uh, you can check out what we do at, at, at UCI in terms of cosmology at the Cosmology Center. Uh, we used to have public talks quite a bit. Um, we're hoping they will come back in the near future. Uh, check us out at cosmology.uci.edu. We have an email list that you can join there. Uh, we have about quarterly uh, announcements through there. A lot of the stuff that I presented was from the American Museum of Natural History, uh, from a site, site called Solar System Scope, and of course Google uh, has the Earth and Sky pretty well mapped too. Hey, you have a question. It. Yeah, why don't you un unmute you? I think you're still, still muted. muted. Uh, let me try again. Okay, I thought I was unmuted. Uh, anyway, the question occurred to me a while back. Uh, do we know where the center of the universe is? Can we locate that? And yeah, also, so, the second question is there anything there now? That's a good question. And the, um, there's, you know, you might think that there. That because it's expanding out into into everywhere, that it should have um, uh, it should have some place where it started. And it turned out that it doesn't have a place where it started other than where you are. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so where you are is where like we see this bubble around us, the cosmic microwave background. It's sometimes called the Hubble bubble. Um, and we are at the center of it. So we're at the center of the universe, you and I, our Earth, our solar system, our galaxy. Um, and but that's just a that's just a, a you know, an accident of causality. We can only see so far because the speed of light is constant. And uh, it's a certain amount of time ago that the cosmic micro background decoupled from the plasma. So we are at the center of our Hubble bubble. Uh, but that's kind of like saying I'm at the center of my horizon on Earth. If you go out on the ocean uh, where you can't see any land, you see the horizon all around you and it's a circle. But that doesn't mean you're at the center of the Earth or the center of the globe of the Earth. So 
Um, it's just a causality and horizon effect. Uh, if, if all the galaxies are uh, moving apart from one another, it seems like they're all moving away from something. So uh, yeah, I guess I have trouble with, uh, with that. Right. Um, they're all moving away from, uh, they're all moving away from uh, a, a denser, earlier, den denser phase. So they're all kind of uniformly moving away. One way of uh, thinking about it is that it's, this is a 2D picture, of course, but uh, it, they, were, they were just at a denser point in early, to, early times, and now they're less dense. Um, that's a 2D picture. A 3D picture maybe is a bit better. Uh, it's a loaf of raisin bread uh, that's infinitely big, and, and it's rising in the oven, and all the raisins are moving away from it. So uh, yeah. you don't, uh, it's in, it, you can never see the edges of it. It's just, it's, it's outside our causal horizon if there's anything different than what we see locally. Uh, the only thing that happens at early times is the galaxies were on top of each other and the, the gas and dark matter was much more dense at early times. And there were no galaxies because stars hadn't formed yet. It was just oh, gas, okay. and, <laughs> gas and light. Les, you have a question, why do you want to mute? All right, thank you. I have, my question has to do with, is there a unifying field out there in space? Is there like an ocean of something and we're all in it or is space just void? What, what, is, what have you seen out there? Um, it's, it's, it's basically void. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, at, at, at this point in time, the mean density of the universe is extremely low. Um, we're, you know, uh, it's about one atom per uh, cubic meter of space is the mean density of the universe. So it's an extremely low density. Um, you know, uh, water's density is 10 to the 23 atoms per 18 milliliters, right? That's Avogadro's number. Um, so it's extremely low density. It's, there's, um, there's nothing there. It's just a bit more dense where there's galaxies and planets. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, how would that be if you count neutrinos and other particles? Uh, the density? Yeah. Uh, neutrinos have to be a, a really small fraction of the overall density, about 10 to the minus four or less, uh, might be a few times 10 to the minus four now. Uh, so they're, um, in terms of the full matter density, neutrinos are, are very small, but they're very important because they change that clustering of galaxies significantly. Chef Wang, you have a question. Why don't you unmute? Yeah. Hi. Uh... I, my question is regarding the inflation of the universe. I was told once that the universe is essentially flat. So, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking like a pizza pie. Uh, so if, if inflation is, is, is going on, you know, does it, does it go on in all direction or just one dimension, for example, only lengthwise or widthwise? Uh, and, and also, if, if you don't mind, maybe just, you know, explain to me, I, I've always been curious, how do they know that the universe is flat? And, you know, flat in what sense? Like, like, a, a, like you know, like an uncooked pizza pie or flat like, uh, I don't know, some other shape where it's, you know, uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm just trying to get a mental picture of, of exactly what the, the shape of the universe is like, other than just, you know, describe it as flat. Um, right. Um... So the universe is a three-dimensional place, right? So uh, the picture of a, a pizza pie is, is, is a good representation, but it's not complete because it's two-dimensional, right? So, but we can still do some two-dimensional geometry that tells us about this, the space. And that is if we have a meter stick at a certain distance, we can do geometry and we see it on the sky, we know it extends some angle, and we know its, its length, then we can find out how far away it is from basic geometry. Um, what happens 
is that uh, in, in general relativity, this triangle could be not uh, straight lines. I didn't really, I wasn't perfect at drawing straight lines anyway, but you can imagine that this is meant to be a straight line triangle. But um, in general relativity, you can have this happen. Exaggerating a little bit, but light could come away from the meter stick and get warped back into where we are. And we would see some other angle theta two where theta two is greater than theta. And we would, in this, pay, in this instance, it's called a positively curved universe. And you could imagine this on a, uh, on a 2D scale, this would be like measuring uh, the, subtension, sub, the subtension of a fixed object on a globe. So a triangle drawn on a globe is gonna have angles that add up to more than 180. So this, this happens. And you can also have a negatively curved universe, uh, which where this happens, where there's a third angle here, theta three, and theta three is less than theta. And so the way we can get at geometry of the universe is we need to see, look at a distance structure and that the best distance structure is the cosmic microwave background whose physics is known. It's just plasma physics and gravity. And we know this extent of the, of the fluctuations on that surface, and they have a certain physical scale. And we can then map out the angle of those, those scales and get at the distance of these structures and the overall geometry of the universe, which is flat, meaning that, it's, that the at, angles add up to 180, roughly speaking. <coughs> Great. Thank you very much. Arvin, why don't you go ahead and unmute? Um, I don't know if this is the right form to ask this question. It's more of a general question, but I just wanted to pick your brain on this. Um, we all know that, I mean, Einstein, and first of all, thanks for such a great presentation. I posted in the chat, but I don't know if you noticed. Uh, it was really good, filled with uh, videos and pictures. It really brought the subject alive. So thank you so much. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, I mean, Einstein's theory was that nothing can move faster than light. So I just wanted to to reconcile that fact with the expanding universe, uh, because if the universe is expanding and light is traveling uh, at the speed of light, uh, shouldn't it be that, you know, when we measure it, then it looks like light has actually traveled larger distance. And because of that, it's actually traveling faster than the speed of light. I don't know. That's just a quandary that I've had in my mind. Thanks. That's a great question. And you can, you can uh, resolve it in general relativity. Um, and part of it is that uh, in general relativity, the galaxies can actually be moving away from each other faster than the speed of light. But it's not because they actually have motion. It's space itself that's expanding it faster than the speed of light. So nothing's moving faster than the speed of light. It's, general, it's the space itself is expanding faster than the speed of light. And these kinds of phenomena can occur uh, within the horizon too, where, it's, where light is decoupled and, it, and the universe is expanding since it decoupled from whatever it got emitted from. So it's actually traveled further than, um, uh, than uh, a fixed reference frame. Pete, why don't you go next? Oh, okay. Uh, there have been quite a few books over the years uh, about some of these things. Uh, Carl Sagan, for example, has billions and billions of stars and so on. I guess now it's trillions, maybe. Uh, also, uh, more recently, Lawrence Krauss had a book, uh, A Universe for Nothing, which is quite a popular book. And uh, uh, then there's another book, uh, Brian Greene uh, book, Until the End of Time. I guess maybe you're familiar, somewhat familiar with those books and like to know what you think of those. Yeah, I haven't read a ton of them. Um, I read when I was a kid, uh, a particle cosmologist book, which is part of my motivation to become a cosmologist. Uh, his name is Heinz Pagels. He was a faculty member at Columbia University. I think the book is out of print called Perfect Symmetry. It's actually pretty good. It starts with Herschel, actually. The first chapter, I think, is called Herschel's Garden. Um, and, um, and it gets into the very early universe. Uh, there's so. I haven't read 
Krauss's most recent books. Um, uh, one book that I would recommend, uh, you know, if you're of interest in humanists and humanism and then kind of big picture concepts, uh, is a book called The Big Picture by Sean Carroll. It actually goes from cosmology to ethics eventually. So it's very interesting. Um, yeah, he's a Caltech, isn't he? He he was a Caltech. I think he is at the Santa Fe Institute at the moment. He may still have a position at Caltech as well, uh, but he's moving to Johns Hopkins in the fall. Oh, okay. Uh, and the uh, Green's book, uh, Until the End of Time, the subtitle is Mind Matter and Our Search for Meaning in an Evolving Universe. So yeah. he's kind of almost trying to cross the line between the two cultures, I guess. Uh, gets into yeah. questions of free will and so on, uh, which is maybe of interest for humanists. So. Yeah, yeah. Sean, Sean's, Sean Carroll's book kind of does that too. I, I'd be interested, if I had more time, I'd read more of these books. <laughs> <laughs> too many books. Kev, I have a question for you. Sure. I just put in the chat, tachyon particles. It's a hypothetical that I've read about, but can you go a little bit more into detail that do tachyon particles even exist and do they move faster than the speed of light? Um, if they existed, they could, they would move faster than the speed of light. Um, there were, there's a lot of um, anomalies that associated with them. There'd be a lot of uh, problems in particle physics as a result of their existence, um, including um, positive energy conditions and, and other conserved quantities and in, in, in general relativity and particle physics. So um, they're uh, hypothetical particles, but they um, are very problematic if they exist. If you remember, there was a neutrino experiment called OPERA that thought that it detected neutrinos moving faster than the speed of light. It turned out to be a, a glitch. Uh, so there was a lot of interest in attacking on nature to neutrinos for a brief while. Um, yeah, there, there's, uh, there are, they, they do exist in certain extensions of standard model of physics, but they are, um, they're, let's just say they're problematic, and there's been no evidence for them yet. Thank you. There's another question: if, Are there any indications of a multiverse uh, from AY? Um, it depends on what you mean by a multiverse. There's different ways of thinking of a multiverse. In many inflationary theories, it is thought that there should be bubbles, like our own Hubble bubble is very, very big, but it's finite. And it could be that there's, I mean, all, certainly there's a connected, disconnected volume of the universe outside our own Hubble bubble. So you could think of that as a different universe. However, it's just causally disconnected from us. It's like you know, uh, one cruise ship can't see another cruise ship once they're far, further, for, far enough away on the ocean. Um, but it doesn't mean they don't both exist. <coughs> so they, that's um, um, that's one way of thinking of them. And they, those other disconnected universes could actually have different physics in them in certain universe uh, inflation models. So that's another way that they're in multiverse. Um, there's uh, also uh, many worlds theories of quantum mechanics that are multiverse theories. And so that's a different form of a multiverse. So it's, it's where the universe is bifurcating at every quantum event, um, which is a very interesting thing because it's going into a different space that is not 4D space. It's in something called Hilbert space. And it's one of the things that's most fun to talk about when I teach quantum mechanics, um, which I'm doing next quarter. Sure. Um, uh, Rebecca had a question in the chat too, but. I have a question. Sure. Uh, how, how do you know that the space itself is expanding? Could it be that the space itself is huge, but fixed and the galaxy just moving away from each other? Um, so that could be the case, uh, but then, um, you'd have to have a theory for a fixed universe. And uh, general relativity actually does not prefer a fixed universe. A, a general relativity, uh, once you write down Einstein's theory for, for gravity, it actually wants a dynamical universe. 
And so Einstein called his biggest blunder trying to make the universe not dynamical because he uh, saw that stars are fixed on the sky, the, the universe seems static. You know, maybe, you know, we need to fix the fact that general relativity is telling us the universe should be expanding or collapsing. So we actually added a, a lambda term, which uh, made the universe actually sit on a very unstable state, but is static. Um, uh, and he called it his biggest blunder. Uh, turns out that there is a lambda term, but it's causing the universe to accelerate its expansion. So uh, short answer is uh, there are no theories of the universe being a static place. Uh, general relativity wants it to be dynamic and the motion of the galaxies are consistent with that. And on top of that, um, the, uh, the universe is, uh, one thing I need to do is keep this iPad from falling asleep so quickly or at all when I'm doing a presentation. Uh, we also know that the cosmic microwave background exists, which tells us the universe was hotter and denser in the past, which means the universe is expanding. Last of all, we actually have a measurement of the universe out here at um, weak freeze out and big bang nucleosynthesis. The abundance of helium in, the, in stars is about 25%. And that's actually created at one second after the big bang, when the universe was even hotter and denser than it was, of course, than the, at the cosmic microwave background decoupling. Uh, it was so hot, nuclei melted. And if you do this calculation, uh, it uh, tells you that the helium abundance is about 24% coming out of the Big Bang, which is consistent with what we see in stars. You don't actually, you don't see stars with less than 24% helium in them. By the way, heat means movement in our uh, normal life. Heat means movement of particle. Okay. What does it mean? What the heat means in, in in this kind of environment, when it melts nucleus, when it melts a nucleus, yeah, I mean, heat I mean, means it movement means of particles. Really hot. Fast... <laughs> no, uh, uh, in our uh, daily life, uh, heat is interpreted as movement of particles. The faster they move, the the yeah. the hotter is uh, the environment. Right. But in this case, uh, it. What the, what, the, what, the, what the heat implies, what the temperature implies, what does it mean? It's exactly the same thing. It's just much more rapid movement of the particles. So we're talking about uh, instead of, uh, you know, 300 Kelvin in our, in our ambient room temperature in Southern California, uh, even outside, uh, we're talking about 10 to the 10 Kelvin. Okay. So Can those, um, the speed of those particles reach the speed of light? Yes, so that's exactly what happens. Light? Yeah. So, um, if uh, the uh, now the protons are are um, are uh, nine hundred and thirty five GeV in mass, uh, I might have the last digit off, but it, they're, they're basically uh, uh, nine hundred thirty MeV in mass. So about a GeV particle. So at, at an MeV, they're still non relativistic. They're still not moving at the speed of light, uh, and so they're um, they're uh, getting, if things are getting there once you start getting up to the hundreds of MeV at the core Cadron transition. At that point, uh, the protons or neutrons are not actually uh, moving at the speed of light yet. They're very hot. They're, they're not, we haven't gotten to a 900 MeV where they would be, but they are actually starting to overlap so that the protons and neutrons are so dense, the universe is so dense, the entire thing is like a neutron star. They've, they've, the neutrons and protons and neutrons are touching and, it, and then they start melting together and forming a quark soup. So that's the quark hadron transition. By the way, does it mean also the temperature, the, uh, the temperature has some sort of upper limit that it cannot go above it? That, uh, the upper limit is infinity. <laughs> um, so it, it's, uh, yeah, the, the, certainly there's some kind of, there's, point, there's a point at which we have no theories for those energies. And that, that point is, is at hundreds of GeV right now. Um, in fact, uh, particle physics is complete out to the Planck scale. However, it has a bunch of anomalies that arise. Um, and so uh, the, uh, the Planck scale is just above this inflation scale. And um, that's where we don't know. So 
uh, out here, you know, there be dragons. Larry, you look like you have a question. Oh, yeah. Is it possible for um, particles to be moving fast enough, hot, that they have relativistic effects? Yeah, uh, normal particles uh, like uh, electrons are become relativistic at, uh, at earlier times than protons and neutrons because they're only half an MeV in mass. So they, they do, um, they become relativistic at, at, um, at the Big Bang nucleus synthesis scale. They, they, they're moving at the speed of light. Oh, my idea is that when you add the energy, they might still have the limitation of the speed of light but as you go closer to the speed of light, they have more energy than they would just from the speed. Right, so they, um, yeah, so just like light can have more energy even though it's moving at the speed of light, what happens is the, the quantum wavelength of, 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 of um, well, the, the relativistic energy still goes up, the, the, the wavelength of, of um, the electron still goes up. So it, it is a, it does, you can gain energy even though you cannot gain speed. Thank you. Another question, Kev, kind of on a weird uh, tangent has to do with not only the expansion of the universe, but uh, how we have macro, or I should say, micro mathematics, uh, quantum physics versus and quantum mechanics, where the math meets, which is string theory. I know I'm kind of all over the place, but what is your understanding of any of this? Um, string theory is a very elegant theory. Uh, it has a lot of interesting implications towards for um, completions of quantum field theory. It's very uh, hard to test. And it's the the the, the um, how do I say it, the, 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 um, the imaginary, one of my favorite quotes from Nietzsche is, uh, the imaginary universe is much bigger than the real universe. Um, so that's kind of my feeling about string theory. It's just too broad and not enough uh, def definition yet. Yeah, it, the, 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 rise, the risal of the standard model of particle physics is far from guaranteed in string theory models. We have the standard model of particle physics, which is very peculiar. And um, who knows why it exists? It's um, not something that you would actually expect from any real symmetric theories. Thank you. Rebecca had a question. Um, do you think someday we'll have techniques to go past the CMB bubble or plasma barrier? Uh, unfortunately, causality keeps us from getting there. We actually can get out. There is a possibility to seeing out to this point weak freeze out, um, which is uh, uh, the point where the neutrinos decouple from the plasma. So if and when we can actually develop neutrino detectors to, to detect the uh, relic neutrinos, we will be able to see a surface like that of cosmic microwave background photons, but in neutrinos. Um, and that would give us even more information from the, when the universe was less than a second old, uh, a fraction of a second, not much smaller than a, a tenth of a second, but around there. Um, so uh, that would give us a lot more information. So um, that gets us back another 380,000 years in age uh, but beyond that, we, we've got causality to deal with, and we can't get past that unless uh, general relativity is broken. I see. Do I use Griffiths and Schroeder? I do. I use Griffiths and Schroeder in my quantum course. Although Sean Carroll is apparently coming up with a new uh, textbook, and if it's if it's good, I may switch. We'll see. Arvin has another question. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, uh, what, where do you think uh, 
I mean, uh, I understand that scientists in this field are pretty much cooperating with each other, but uh, just uh, it, there's a two part question. Uh, but first is, how do you see competition versus cooperation? Do you think American cosmology is kind of, you know, uh, losing or, or you know, slowing down compared to Europe where all the action is in terms of CERN and all the particle acceleration experiments going on there? Do you think they're uh, getting better or doing better than us? And what do you think we should do about it? And second is, uh, I don't know if this is again appropriate for this forum, but uh, bringing this into the real current world and current events, uh, there's uh, the, the Russia sanctions that has affected a lot of the space programs. Do you see any impacts in the scientific field on that as well? Thanks. Uh, yeah, so for the first question, uh, I think the US is still a pretty strong leader in science and including cosmology. Um, uh, JWST is like one of the hallmarks of that. Um, of course, they're in partnership with European space agencies and the Japanese space agency, JAXA, for a lot of these space missions. So, um, you know, I think that losing our leadership is a real threat though. So I think investing in science and education is, is a, a very good decision. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's kind of, you know, in terms of particle physics, uh, Europe is leading now and with the, with CERN, we're of course a partner in that. Um, but it's not gotten to the point where I would say we're not, we're not a leader <laughs> cannot, you know, um, and in terms of what's going on with Russia, I think we have to like, uh, be careful to not blame Russians. Uh, uh, that are not directly responsible for what's going on in Ukraine. Um, and so, uh, the, you know, just like I wouldn't blame every American for our previous president, um, I would, uh, you know, uh, warn against uh, sanctioning scientists um, who are not directly involved. So I, I think there's, there's, um, um, there's a careful balance that you have to take in these kinds of things. Thanks, Kev, so much. Uh, we want to be mindful of your time. Uh, we have about 15 minutes before the end of the hour. Uh, anything else you want to conclude with or any other questions that people have? I'll just leave uh, with these uh, resources. Check out, check out uh, our Cosmology Center. Um, we hope to be back with activities in the upcoming academic year for sure. Thanks all. Well, once again, Kev, thanks uh, on behalf of the Humanist Association of Orange County. We really appreciate you uh, enlightening us and sharing this with us and uh, wish you well. And uh, especially in working at UCI and teaching those uh, wonderful dubious students. So uh, good luck to you and thank you once again. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. It's always great to chat with, with a diverse group of people. Thanks Take everyone. Care. Have a good thank day. Thank you. Thanks, Kev.